All right. I'll tell you what. We'll give it a little, another five minutes, just in case anybody's looking to join at the last second. And we'll just awkwardly sit around for a little bit. Now, just as a reminder, for those that are willing to join into the chat, uh, and if you got questions, this is where uh, I suppose we need a chat for this. Quick, create channel, text channel, Q and and there you go. And you should be able to pop into the Q&A channel to type some questions. Yeet. Yes, yeet is the correct response here. Now, just as a reminder to everyone, um, this is going to be recorded. So if you are going to be using voice, I would recommend you just keep that in mind. I'm just going to ping around a couple of other places just to let them know that this is going to start. Probably turn the uh, sleep mode on the headset. Goes to sleep on me. Bango. So, while we're waiting, can I get a quick hello in the chat to see how everybody's doing today? Jamo, you should be going to sleep after this. I would recommend this. Sleep is very good. Yes, yes. That Emily's got the right idea. It's a little weird. I'm talking to a bunch of virtual people and all I see is a bunch of people in the chat. It's absolutely fantastic. Quite good, although I sorely underestimated how much I'll be presenting today. And it took me the entirety of my spare time this week to pull all of the media together. So uh, this this is gonna this is gonna be a good this is gonna be good, man. Oh no, I've missed something in the slide. Ah, it's fine. I'll tell you what, I'll post what I missed in the slide into the chat. While we're waiting that little bit longer. Uh, I would recommend you give 100% attention to me because I'm an attention whore like that. But um, yeah, there's going to be a lot happening in this bit of a talk. So uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, basically strap yourselves in. It's going to be a bit of a wild ride. If I could find that thing with me drinking beer, that would be great. No, I cannot find it. Never mind.
Oh, yes. Yes, Everly makes a good point. Yes, that, that GIF is in off topic. I, I'm going to now share it and do this and then go to this. My favorites have disappeared. This is unacceptable. And bingo, bingo. So this is currently me. It may not be a true representation of what I'm doing right now. So just as another reminder for those joining, this is going to be recorded. And uh, basically, if you're going to hop in the voice chat, please just keep that in mind. I'm going to keep the Q&A chat running just for that little bit. So that way, you know, we can ask some questions and I'd be happy to answer them. Ah, pff, it, it's beer. Yes, it's it's beer. It does not look like beer. I can tell you it is not what it looks like. It is, in fact, beer. I may or may not be drinking while we're speaking. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go grab a beer. Two seconds. Vincent says demo beer drinking ASMR. Well, ah, good stuff. All righty. Well, uh, I guess pretty much everybody that's going to join is going to be joining. So can we get a quick vote? Shall we get started? Get the party going? Baby, it's not sir, it's doctor. Get it right. <laughs> Something like that. All right. This is going to be a first for me. It is going to be the first of many, many talks, I hope. And it's going to be very informal. So for those in the chat, go ahead and answer away. But today, well, this is going to be a bit of an introduction to me. Dr. Damo with a side serving of refreshing beer. So for those that haven't met me, welcome. The name's Damien Rompapas, most call me Dr. Damo. And for those that have met me, it's good to see you again, even if you're, you know, virtually floating around. So really what today is going to be about is, well, how I turned from uh, this handsome individual in my high school years to the lovely Dr. Damo that you see today, including the entire journey in between. And well, before we could go into that one, let me tell you a little bit about myself as I am right now. So Dr. Damo, 29 years old, not even in my thirties yet, but I'm getting that boomery feeling as we're talking right now. I'm about 162 centimeters tall. I weigh a good stouty 85 kilos. That makes me a bit of a dwarf. And my professions, well, I'm a software engineer. I build software, I love software, and ones and zeros. I work primarily in game science and as an XR specialist. And for those that don't know what XR is, XR is basically the notation for extended reality, which includes your AR, your VR, and all of the fun stuff in between. Now, I like anything fun. Doesn't necessarily need to be related to what I do, but I like anything that's fun. The exception is Fortnite. Fortnite is not fun and I will stab anybody that agree does not agree with me. What I don't like, and for those that have met me in person, is any form of injustice, especially when those, you know, when we don't get what we deserve. 
most people that have met me tend to describe me as an unrelenting force of nature. I set my sights on something, you're damn well right it's going to get done, no matter how I get my way to do it. Now back, way back, long, long ago, at the age of eight years old, was my first bout with computer science. My parents had an old Commodore 64 sitting upstairs, and it wasn't functioning, so I decided to pull that apart and function it myself. And I got to learn what the well, basics of programming were, including that lovely little pun there. So I got to play with the Commodore 64 and the Visual Basic uh, scripting code that you were able to do on the Commodore 64. So this is at the age of eight years old, keep in mind. And well, this was the first pro project that I ever did, quite a few years down the line. So I'm just going to leave this for a little bit and just sit back and have another beer. Uh, yes, there is supposed to be sound. Is there no sound? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> So what you just saw was actually my first real experience. I actually did my own uh, undergraduate degree here at the uh, in South Australia at the University of South Australia, and primarily in games and entertainment design. And among the many things that I did during that journey, my capstone project involved uh, an industry partner integration. And the basic idea was to try to teach teachers how we can help deal with those kids that are at risk of leaving schools. And the idea was that by training the teachers, we can get the teachers better prepared to engage with the students when they're most at risk and therefore keep them within the schooling to give them a better future. So we translated a 2D cardboard board game into a full digital 3D medium. And part of this, there was some award that I won, and I won't go into the circumstances of that award because it's not entirely PG, but it gives you a bit of background that even way back then, I was a Unity Primera developer along with a bunch of other projects at the same time. So this is another one of those many projects they lay dormant in stone that I developed outside of the concept. but now it's time to awaken Peak. 
What you just saw was probably my first uh, foray into the indie uh, game development world way back in 2013. So I was just barely old enough to drink in some countries and I was already, you know, producing somewhat high quality games. And the idea behind this game was to essentially merge an infinite runner with kind of a Mortal Kombat theme, which... Uh, while it may not have been a market success, it's still one of my more proudest achievements because as a developer for the first time, I was given a two month deadline to produce what you've just seen. And this is where I was working with one game designer who designed the mechanics of the game and one person who did all of the pixel art and uh, animation. And the system itself was quite complex. It ran off of a credit system with a leadership board. So, Shortly after my uh, graduation as a uh, undergrad and post this kind of uh, project, uh, I decided, you know, it's about time I went international. I was recruited by Dr. Christian Sandor and uh, we just decided, hey, you know, let's make a move for it, go international. So I ended up moving to uh, the Nara Institute of Science and Technology over at Nara, Japan. So right between Osaka, Kyoto and the city, central city of Nara. And it was a somewhat interesting experience for me for the first time going across. So we'll start off with this little project to give you a context. So you can see that handsome individual that's walking on screen. There's a reason why I was up all night that night. I was basically given a Google Glass and a weekend to do something with it. So you can see the idea as I'm walking around through the Google Glass, I'm able to see that the music rendered on top of this traditional marker and presented in front of the camera. Although the music is quite trash, the experience was so enjoyable, especially the Japanese love this. So this became a bit of a meme among the university and how it became very famous among the uh, university in Japan. But within a weekend, I had an animation, a rigged model, music track, and had to write a traditional marker tracker in order to achieve all of this. But it really told us what the Google Glass was capable of, and that was going to be important for many reasons later down the line. So this Hatsune Miku Dance AR basically showed what the capabilities of the uh, Google Glass was as an Android platform for augmented reality. And really, most my first experience with augmented reality technology. And we came up with a few concepts later down the line as part of a master's degree, and this is one of them, so Glass Quest. So as a Google Glass user, I was able to see that somebody needed some help with posting a quest and the idea is that you answer these quests in order to get credits or points by helping each other out.
it's a, a unique concept for sure, especially given the uh, the social acceptance of the Google Glass. But wasn't exactly ready for it. It was a little bit too advanced for its time. This, we moved a little bit further into uh, my research journey, and uh, the the core concept was how much further can we push the Google Glass. So the idea was that we have user A standing on one side of the wall and user B standing within a room. And by using the two camera views available on the Google Glass and some assumed geometry of the environment, we're able to create a visualization through this wall, like using X-ray vision. And well, you can see for the results yourself that even including a 3D reconstruction was not such a hard problem. And this was something that could be quite useful for emergency situations. For example, if there's been an earthquake and some rubble, a pilot could fly a drone over a known area and then relay this back into the Google Glass. So this was my first demonstration to be presented at an international conference. And that landed me somewhat over in Shenzhen, China, where I got my first taste of what international conference glory looks like. Um, it was quite an enjoyable experience. I got to meet many people as a student volunteer for SIGGRAPH Asia, I think back in 2014. Just as an extra side note, the times and dates may be a little bit off by a bit, so excuse my recollections. But as you can see, I had a lot of fun. Maybe a little too much fun. I ended up completely wiped by the end of that. And that kind of ended up spawning a meme among those that know me. And you'll start to figure out what that meme is as we go along. So when I came back, um, one of the interesting projects that we had, we were discussing a project with Nishiki Yoshinari and the local scout group over in Japan. And the idea was to basically translate a lot of the activities that the scout troops would do to augmented reality activities by using clever means. One of them included a uh, kind of a video see-through experience where we would see on the tablet and some information overlaid of one of the older scout troops that were part of that role in this particular scout group, giving some lecture on what it means to be a scout. Um, I accept, I apologize for the potato quality images because the project is quite old. There's a lot of information that's archived, but you can see in the top center, one of them included this uh, kind of VR POCO. Um, and the idea was that you had these uh, virtual cubes through the virtual reality Google Cardboard headset. And you've got that strapped to one kid's head. So he's completely blind to the outside world. And the idea is that the kid would relay back to the people that are walking with him how where the global targets are. And the two people following this kid would help to make sure that the kid can reach those targets without getting into too much trouble. And this focused heavily on the communication between the kids involved. Um, finally, uh, one of the uh, more interesting experiences on the right was we carried, we'd have a student carrying a backpack with a giant additional marker on it. And an additional marker would be for this climbing tree jungle gym. And the idea was a third person would be seeing where the virtual targets are that the kid climbing this jungle gym would be and would try to direct the kid climbing the jungle gym towards these targets. So this was me trying to see, you know, what, what kind of social boundaries can we pull with this technology? And I'm not going to lie, compared to what I've been building now, this was quite uh, rudimentary as an experience, but the kids absolutely enjoyed it. In fact, one of them I hear for now is currently doing his undergrad in computer science because of this experience. So quite a lot of positive outcome came from this project. Now, for those interested, I am happy to share the links later. But we'll move on a little bit. Now, this is where the grunt of my actual master's degree was. And this is kind of combining all of the information that I'd been building up to until then. And basically, the idea is that by... Oh, you know what? Oh, screw this. I'll just play the video. The video can explain it better than I can. So I built some display prototype. And the idea is that, you know, through the lens of this prototype, you can focus back and forth throughout the scene and see a highly you know, realistic rendering. So we did this by, I designed you know, some auto-refractor machine 
that was able to measure the uh, focal depth of the user's eye as they sat behind it. And then we would place this within a box enclosure. And this box enclosure included an optical display setup. And the user would see inside this box enclosure to get the results. And as the user focuses back and forth at the physical dragons throughout the scene, this kind of information is replicated in computer graphics using advanced ray tracing techniques. And it was quite responsive. This was presented at two conferences and uh, some people may recognize the face from the second picture and uh, some of the stickers that I use, especially in Telegram. But that was my second, uh, well, international conference where I was speaking in front of hundreds of people. And well, this is the second one. So, as you can see, I was a little flamboyant even back then. And that suit was also way too fucking expensive, but worth every single penny because, well, I mean, I got the best demo award that year, didn't I? That included my uh, ugly mug in the local newspaper. So this is where I got to understand what my true superpower is, and it seems to be entertainment. If I can't make you laugh, I ain't doing my job right, am I right? And... As you can see, after both conferences, it was a bit too much, even for me. So, as part of my little journey, I had a little random side quest over in Finland. So, right towards the end of my master's degree, I was brought over there into Olu, Finland. And uh, fun stories behind that one for when we're drinking at the pub. But the main purpose of me being over there was basically to do some random task that was assigned to me as part of an internship while I was writing the rest of my master's thesis. And the idea behind this was to implement the same kind of fiducial marker tracking as an open source implementation that I showed for the Hatsune Miku dance. And as you can see, well, this took me less than a weekend to get working compared to the month timeline that I'd been given, which meant that I ended up having a lot of free time on my hands. As you see, it's actually quite robust on a per image basis. We're able to track the rotation and translation of those markers. So I ended up coming back home and uh, finalizing that master's degree and I became, you know, from undergrad demo to master demo. But of course, this isn't the end of this journey. So sadly, it wasn't without turmoil and trouble. I ended up getting in a bit of a fight which resulted in me having the decision of quitting my PhD or looking for an alternative job for more funding. And I decided to say, well, fuck this. I'm giving a third option of I take a six month break from my PhD and decided to go get myself hired in Singapore. Now, I mentioned that I ended up having met a lot of friends during my first conference. That's actually, you know, Lim Damien. Uh, we call him D1, uh, who ended up inviting me over to play CTO. And, well, this is what ended up happening in six months. Children are full of curiosity and learn best through exploration. They are quick learners, adapting to their environment and picking up new skills by observing what others do. It is the best time to expose them to activities that challenge their problem-solving abilities. Building the foundation of coding for your child is important. Jules understands that a quality preschool education is essential. Through a structured computational thinking curriculum, 
children will learn to harness the power of technology to their advantage. In February 2016, Jules launched the world's first computational thinking game curriculum, School of Fish for Preschoolers. Computational thinking, or CT, refers to a system of understanding and solving problems in a logical way that people and computers can understand. In essence, we need to turn our kids from technology consumers to creators. And computational thinking allows us to make this change. Our educational and engaging program includes a 64-hour curriculum consisting of over 100 hands-on activities, more than 20 episodes of animations, and online puzzle games. School of Fish uses both offline and online activities to teach preschoolers concepts such as pattern recognition, decomposition, abstraction, and algorithmic thinking. Links to the child's account, our Jules Digital Dashboard provides parents with real-time information and analytics on their child's performance in school. The game features an intelligent avatar platform, Jules Buddies, which can be customized and will accompany preschoolers through their learning journey. Jules believes that education needs to evolve to empower children with the skills for tomorrow. And our mission is to create and teach computational thinking through games children love. With a strong foundation in computational thinking, we are giving preschoolers a head start as the Singapore Ministry of Education introduces coding in primary schools. Speak to us today to find out how our curriculum will benefit your child. For more information, visit us at www.jules.sg. So marketing aside and marketing nonsense aside, what we developed was actually quite special. The aim, quite simply, was to try to teach kindergarten kids the kind of thinking that I practice almost every single day now. This kind of computational thinking where we try to teach concepts of algorithmic thinking, abstraction, decomposition, and there is another one, pattern recognition. That's right. So... It was through a uh, tablet digital medium, so the uh, virtual video games and some animated episodes, as well as offline activities, paper worksheets and uh, quiz puzzles and whatnot, that the kids got their first foray into, you know, how we think in a way that enables us as problem solvers and programmers. So it was very successful, I got to say, and performed much better than the original product I imagined it would be. So I worked with a team of very talented developers I had never really been inside this kind of uh, industrial setting before. So a bunch of novices, including myself, to turn this idea into reality. And we ended up winning a fair few awards. And I believe to this day, it's actually worth a fair amount now. But you're wondering why I've got that, uh, that picture on the right hand side where you've got this guy in a stuffed costume meeting the you know, education minister in Singapore. Yeah, that's me. So I decided to volunteer to be the first guy inside that costume for a lot of the video that you saw. I got to meet the Ministry of Education per firsthand. Quite, quite exciting. I just wish I wasn't inside this hot ass uniform on a 35 degree humid day. And it's pretty much what I did while I was in Singapore. I got to play boss CTO and enjoy all of the development experience and apply it. And you can see that kind of wore me out in more ways than one. However, when I left Japan, I made that connotation, I'll be back. And oh boy, did I come back. So I hate leaving things unfinished and I damn well wanted that doctorate. So I came back and continued that PhD. But I didn't want to continue working on the same thing that I'd left. So the uh, augmented reality eye-based uh, content. So it became the question, what do I do then? Cue the video. Begin transmission. Welcome to Hollow Royale. Earth will soon be under invasion by virtual robots. We are recruiting squads of three members to combat the enemy. Each squad member will utilize a Microsoft HoloLens controller and be accompanied by two virtual drones to help defend a local university area. There are three stages in this battle. First, squad members scatter to defend bases around the area. Squad members do this by firing lasers from their drones. Second, players converge to a radio uplink to record combat data and intel. Our 
combat interface will direct you to the radius location. After enough intel has been uncovered, one final challenge awaits. And list now. So, you can tell and that I love to be somewhat entertaining. And this is the Dr. Damer way of recruiting participants for a user study. So, what I built can be explained in this video a little better. We introduce Hollow Royale, a large-scale, high-fidelity, multiplayer augmented reality game. Holo Royale uses the powerful AR infrastructure of the Microsoft HoloLens, providing accurate tracking and registration and realistic interactions between computer graphics and the environment. Our game works over large scales. Because of this, we employ game design elements specific to large scale, such as spatial navigation cues to guide players around the play area, diegetic propellers to keep players away from dangerous and unplayable areas, and symbolic attractors to highlight key locations. We provide voice communication for players to encourage collaborative play over the large game area. The setup process is straightforward. First, we scan and annotate the play area section by section. We align sections using ICP to create one global map. We place game content on this map and store the results on a game server. We have expanded the standard play area of the HoloLens from room to campus scale. Our next goal is world scale. We invite you to come and take up the challenge. So the basic idea is that we take the Microsoft HoloLens and say, well, it's great for room scale areas, but what if I wanted to make something like Ready Player One across the city area? So that was the basic challenge of my uh, PhD thesis. And the result of this was the Hollow Royale game that you've just seen, including the lovely participant video, where people would come in under the premise of playing a game, but the reality was that I was actually capturing data. Now, as part of this, I ended up demonstrating once again all the way over in Germany, where you could see I ended up wearing uniform fit for the job. And I'll play a little video of a short presentation. Let this be a note on how to deal with live presentations that don't go so well. it went well. It went a little better than I expected it to. I got to enjoy a lot more about that project than I thought I would. However, it's never without a fun side quest to go on top of this. So right near the end of my PhD, I ended up making my way over to the UK. 
But why the hell would I end up all the way over there, you ask? Well... So the basic idea of this was to take a look at what Pokemon Go did and said, why don't we like it? What can we do better about it? And well, I mean, I had the perfect code from my PhD thesis to implement such a large scale game. So we trialed this user experience all over the UK where using a mobile phone, you can engage with a live multiplayer arena. And this was the result, Holoscape. By using a mobile phone, and only a mobile phone, you would engage with virtual battles with your friends to defend areas. So it was a little bit of an uh, experiment that I did over in the UK. I was given less than a month to develop my uh, AR system into what you've just seen. And uh, along with a few other things, it was quite successful. Um, although some of the other misadventures I got up to were also just as interesting and wild. And then there was randomly a side quest within a side quest. So while I was in the UK, I ended up getting contacted by somebody in order to do something what I thought would be quite interesting. So I yeeted my way over to Scotland and I built another prototype. The scale of Parkinson's, currently there are over 12 million people in the world with Parkinson's disease, many of which suffer from um, a poor gait, freezing and uh, lack of cognition. The product is a pair of augmented reality glasses. This works by putting visual markers in the real world, the patient would see markers on the, on the floor. They'd also hear a rhythmic cue in their ear, which enables them to walk without a fascinating gait. It's quite an old concept. The theory behind the glasses comes from research papers in the 60s and 70s that used markers on the ground to enable Parkinson's patients to step over them, therefore taking a wider step, a longer step, and a more rhythmical step Audio markers as well have also been used for a number of Parkinson's patients, again, to do the same and to stop freezing episodes. The potential reach for our product um, in, the, in the UK and the US, there's uh, around uh, or just over a million people who suffer from Parkinson's uh, and globally there is around uh, 12 million people. In, in the first three years of training, we envisage selling 40,000 units. Uh, the retail uh, cost of the units are around £2,300. Intellectual property for the software is owned by us. Um, we have a developer who has worked in-house for us to develop the, um, the walking software. We are also working with a, a partner who will manufacture the hardware, the headsets, and that will deliver the software to the, um, the user. The edge funding will be used to develop a prototype or prototypes alongside our manufacturing partner. 
the ultimate ambition for this part of the business is to cease trading because we'd like to see an end to this debilitating condition that is Parkinson's. So you've probably already noticed that gigantic contraption that was strapped to that old dude's face and maybe the little hint of the quote unquote developer that they'd commissioned. Yeah, that was me. So that was my job. My job was to build a big plastic janky thing to prove a concept. And the idea was quite simply to render virtual markers on the floor to help deal with Parkinson's. And you can see that this more recent photo, it kind of aged very well compared to the product that I have today, and we'll talk a little bit more later. But these guys are doing absolutely amazing work in order to help those with Parkinson's, and I was very grateful to be part of that little side quest and enjoy the lovely life over in Scotland and a few extra whiskeys before I headed back to the UK to finish my main side quest within the UK. But all third things must come to an end. And I finally got that doctorate. As you can see, I finally became Dr. Demo. And, well, everything must end well. I ended up returning home for that little bit and took a six month hiatus from everyone in the internet in order to explore a few things uh, were of other personal interests, not including cars and shooting phones with guns. I didn't quite leave one of those projects alone while I was in the UK though. So we ended up revisiting Holoscape a little bit and turning it into a, a near commercial product, including all of the assets and uh, menus and full game design elements. So what you're seeing here is what nearly happened before, unfortunately, the company I was working with ended up getting bought out. So the idea was very simple. You got a basic Pokemon Go style interface that acts a bit like an RPG where you get to choose your class and your supposed powers as a result of this. And then when you connect into the AR world, these you can see this is my backyard within Australia. You would first try to give the system a bit of an understanding where the floor is in order to, you know, where understand in the AR environment and then normally you would take a picture if you're in the UK but quite obviously I'm not in the UK so I'm going to fake this a little bit by giving it a picture within the UK instead so the way I could showcase this experience a little bit and then once it was fully connected it would place the content within the environment and you would have this full high fidelity gameplay uh, version of the PhD thesis that I did which the basic idea is you're defending these bases that would come under attack every now and then by virtual targets. And this included uh, useful utilities to try to boost you up as you leveled up. And it was a unique challenge in many ways. One of them was in creating the content. One of them was designing, you know, what is our physical limitations? Because of course, we're not superheroes. We can only run around as fast as we physically can. And it, what are the kind of game challenges that we can incorporate as part of our spatial environment? So while this is one of my more favorite projects, it sadly is, is one that did not finish. And uh, while it does upset me that it did not finish, I was still very proud of the idea that we had this uh, concept of uh, social gaming. However, it was not all the early projects. I decided to learn how cars work. And that was a very dangerous idea because I came up with the idea, if we had virtual simulators that were quite good, could someone like myself, who is a P plater, learn how to drift a car using this virtual environment and then using such a platform that's capable of doing this, would day one at the track result in me doing epic skiddies around corners? And that's kind of the premise of this project. I built up a VR sim area. You can see in the bottom right, I'm actually training within this on learning how to drift. For example, in this case, on Mount Akina, which is famous in the initial D quest. And in the top right is the Toyota Caldina that I bought specifically to take the engine out of it and stick it in my Toyota Celica in order to turn it into the platform for this experiment. This is still an ongoing project. It turns out engine swaps are significantly more complicated than I expected them to be. But it is one that I foresee in the very near future uh, will hopefully be completed with grace.
makes you wonder, what did I do next? Well, my dream has always been to create augmented reality content that I can freely interact with, much to the point where anybody with a headset can interact with virtual windows like as some part of sci-fi future. And while I was working at the UniSA, I got to try the HoloLens too and was severely disappointed with uh, the field of view of the device as well as some of the deck capabilities within it. So, like any good engineer, I screamed at it and screamed very hard and then decided to say, well, maybe we can build better. So that's what I did in the six months. I sat down and I worked very hard. Well, I guess in these troubled times, we all have to entertain ourselves somehow. Introducing Project Desky, an open source software framework for high fidelity extended reality experiences capable of deployment on any combination of head-worn display, compute pack, and tracking systems. This enables users to create high fidelity XR experiences with persistence, six degree of freedom head tracking, and hand interactions with virtual content. Our synchronous rendering pipeline allows us to include techniques to handle renderer and tracking latencies via asynchronous, temporal reprojection and pose prediction. This allows us to run Project Esky on much cheaper and weaker hardware but still achieve the same high fidelity. This project is open source, making it a powerful research and development tool for both researchers and hobbyists to rapidly develop high fidelity XR experiences. This was an accomplishment for me because it showed that I very much knew exactly what is required in order to create this high quality content. And not surprising that it did win a couple of awards at a couple of conferences. The, the basic premise was to allow any AR headset to achieve the same kind of visual quality that the Microsoft HoloLens touts itself for. And well, I mean, it kind of started an interesting journey, which is where we come to, to this today and age with a familiar logo. Welcome to beer. Broad Engagement Extended Reality Labs. And well, what is beer is very interesting. So it is a games and entertainment studio that works in XR development as well as XR games and research as well as your regular, you know, computer games. So from this point on is where we start getting into the present day and what I'm up to to this day and age. And now I work with many students and many people, not just locally, but internationally. And this is one of those projects that started with a random, hey, Dr. Damo, do you want to do something? And my response being, you're goddamn right. Hand interactions with virtual content is often difficult as we do not have any physical tactile feedback. We present VisioTouch, a visual cue system that replicates real world hand behavior inducing a psychological tactile feedback response. Using a hand tracked rig, we are able to interact with virtual content and capture the point of contact on a virtual object. We then use a second IK rig, which replicates the hand tracked rig, but solves the finger orientation towards the captured contact point. By combining the visual cue of the IK rig, and an occlusion mask for the hand track rig, we are able to provide a visual cue that replicates physical touch. The result allows for more precise interactions with virtual content without the need for physical tactile feedback.
So this was important for two reasons. One, it showed that any demonstration using Project Esky could be built within five days. That includes ideation, the paper writing, and the actual product development, and the demonstration recording. And that's kind of the deadline that myself and one lovely Indian individual uh, internationally ended up doing together across two time zones. The second, I hope is one that many people are familiar with, and is my first foray into seeing Ken Dr. Demo lead a group of students to glory, where I had a whole bunch of undergraduates to work with, a very neat game idea. Uh, let's get her! We present Rock and Bop Boxing, an AR game that complies with current social distancing requirements. To do this, we must bypass the limited hand tracking volume provided by the AR platform. We bypass this limitation by using spring attached virtual representations of the user's real hand. This spring attached hand tool allows for two users to engage virtual punches in an intense boxing match with the aim of knocking the virtual head attached avatar off of the opponent's head. After viewing the live demonstration rematch between the live actors, we hope that spectators in VR will enjoy playing this game against us live actors. Which reminds me, I better get back to training in the hopes that I will meet you in the virtual ring. So this went very well. It's one of my more prouder moments, to be honest. Fuck, I'm starting to cry. Um, so I worked with a series of students in order to create this. And it was basically an augmented reality cross virtual reality game. But give me a moment. And the basic idea was that we could bypass the uh, social distancing limits of two meters in order to create this interaction real time between several users and uh, the game no longer exists but is something that I'm very interested in recreating into a commercial product so maybe we can look forward to that and this last one is again another system that was built within a week with two individuals involved <laughs> So while that was entertaining, especially at the end of it, that was a real recording of my actual reaction to the content. Because 
This is something, again, that was developed in five days. And the basic idea was to extend live concerts, which are unable to be to happen during the coronavirus situation. So how can we enhance the living room experience with this kind of interaction? And once we had developed this system, it was sent over to me and... I played it and live captured the video recording of, you know, what it looked like and said, this is something that's good. We quite enjoyed this. And finally, well, I mean, many people know this story already of the Arc Linkage Grant that was accepted as part of, uh, you know, and, uh, cooperation between the NESA and India Solutions, as well as, you know, Beer Lab supporting the idea. And a very clever student, James Campbell, helped work with me on this idea to, you know, get these headsets working with an AR headset, working with a robot. And as you can see, well, we refurbished a little robot with, an R with a Raspberry Pi, and we're driving it with a headset. We're able to command a little robot to do our bidding. All that. When's the last time you charged it? No. <laughs> And he did a very, very good job. And the main importance of this was this particular individual had never worked with an augmented reality headset, let alone with a game engine. And it was trying to prove that through Project Esky, we're able to create very easy to understand experiences very quickly. And it made me wonder, you know, you know, what's the future? What's the future? is the question on my mind at that point when I left the UniSA and started working with an agriculture tech company called Think Digital. And it was a very interesting foray into a field that, well, I'd never seen before. And that meant going onto the farms and seeing some of the problems that the farmers have. And this is where I can see the true, one of the true applications of such augmented reality experiences in the field. One example is, you know, being able to provide this training to individuals that have never worked there and assistance via the visualization techniques, or even turning something like orange picking into a video game. And among this are a whole bunch of other projects within Beer Labs. And this is something that probably some of you already recognize the name of one of the individuals on. absolutely glorious every moment of it so the basic premise was to take an ar headset and remove some of its limitations to put it ready for the industrial application and uh a lovely special guest vincent as well as again james campbell joining in on this one helped me figure out the 3d modeling behind the uh, form factor that i needed now we're going to go into a little bit of uh, the game development realm that Beer Labs has done. And for those that know me will already know what's about to come, but we actually have a title on the Nintendo Switch. It's a cute little 2D platformer. Thank you. 
Yeah, just as a random side mode, the group chat, someone's like GG easy mode. And yeah, we kind of put that in there because we understood that not everybody can play this kind of game out of the box because it very much heavily challenged people's spatial understanding, especially when you have to go upside down and start moving around. But that's not the only game we've worked on. We've got another game cooking in the freaking background that I can't wait to unleash on the entire world. And I'm kind of proud of this one too. So I'm going to give you a double dosage. First, I'm going to throw the trailer at you. So welcome to Ned Kelly, a Metroidvania with a Ned theme to it. But you're wondering what the hell does Ned have to do with this kind of sci-fi future? Well... Gather round, folks. Let me tell you a yarn. Of a land rough, tough, unforgiving. Rolled by the rich, or the poor man was starved. It's only just the beginning. Deep in the bush, in a beaten up shack, lived a bush ranger, an outlaw out back. Ed Kelly was he who tried to live off the land, but was arrested unjustly, forced to then make a stand. With a score now to settle and nothing to lose, formed the Kelly gang on the run from the noose. Hold up some thieving, the front page story. The locals just loved them, the infamous get glory. But the end was in sight for this gang of crooks. For a siege was inevitable, one for the books. At last they were ambushed at the Glen Rowan Inn. Took fire from the cops. Iron armour, too thin. The 
think you get the kind of idea that we're going for for this one. And again, it's something that we've worked with a very talented artist who has just joined into the chat, a very talented couple of game designers and a very couple of talented, nice little developers that have been working under my advisement to kind of complete the game. We're kind of hoping for next year to be our release date, but hopefully before then we can get some demo out for you guys to play. And that kind of, kind of what gets me excited these days. We do a lot of projects and very happy about it. So this is where I leave off. Welcome to Brood Engagement Extended Reality Labs. And well, I mean, the kind of idea behind this presentation was to you see like what my track record looks like. So that way you can see I'm not just some old individual rambling my tongue when I'm talking about these things, but rather there's quite a lot of experience behind the design and development of a lot of these experiences. So I'm hoping this will be a very good setting stone for the talks that we have in the near future. With that, I'm very happy to be open for either people to pop in on the voice chat or for those to, you know, take some questions over in the chat. So uh, I guess this is where I, you know, I kind of get out some calm music or something. I kind of hadn't thought that one through. So what I'll do is I'll pause the, uh, I'll stop the recording and then switch over to uh, non-live mode.